Yeah, I know. This is a sub-video series of a sub-video series of a video series. I know. But this is probably the last one, I hope. For now, anyways. So yeah, I've talked about the conceptual and philosophical aspects of Mecha, and I've also talked about the machines in terms of their designs and portrayal. So I think it's only fair I focus in on the really cool folks who design the machines themselves and the effects that they have had on the genre as a whole. Now, why? Well, there's two simple reasons, really. One, they are horribly neglected. Seriously, it hurts me how much people in general ignore hardworking artists who make these things that they'll praise on and on, but will never even bother to remember the names of those very same people responsible for making those portrayals possible. Or, if they do remember a name, it only goes as far as something like Hideo Kojima or Yoshiyuki Tamino, but not Yoji Shinkawa, or today's video topic, Person in Question. Which is also sad, because it don't matter if it's a game, or a movie, or whatever, art is always collaborative, and if you really care about these things, I think it's only fair to recognize those who are responsible for putting the work in to making them possible. As for reason number two, I'm one of them. Yeah, sorry if it was not obvious. I did not obviously work on any big anime, but I understand and share that mindset that they have. This obsession and fixation on cool machines, on the mechanical, and I also like weird machines. I honestly don't care about cars for the most part, sorry, but like cool things like submarines and stuff, like that's, that's my jam. And as well, I'm an artist, so yeah, I know how hard it is to just imagine some of this stuff, then to focus it into a design, then to endlessly nitpick your own work until the feeling of satisfaction is completely a stranger to you, and you end up as nothing more than a ball of sinew and bones, moving only by sheer force of will to reach an unattainable perfection. But enough about me! So yeah, Kunio Okawara. Okawara is someone who I think was in the right time and place, but, on another level, also put in a great effort of work, and who inadvertently, or advertently, ended up shaping some of the most important and popular mecha franchises and machines. While young kids today, I'm sure, are all up about in their Kawamori's or Kotoki's, you really would not get a ton of that were it not for folks like Kunio Okawara. Okawara was born in and lives in Inagi, Japan. His presence in the industry is such that as an artist, it's kind of weird for me to think about mecha without first thinking about Okawara's work. His designs feel really like this kind of blueprint, like this early common ancestor later designers would build on. For me, it feels strange to think about his work as being anything less than this great default to start with when studying mechanical design. For example, his proportions are stocky, but very normal feeling. Not too lanky, not too adjusted or min-maxed or too big or too thick or too thin. They feel like a good baseline template. And the reason for this is simple. Okawara's designs essentially mark many of the most significant and popular mecha in that big turning point, the 1970s to 80s. They are coming from a design background clearly familiarized with the bright, flashy commercial style mecha had, of mecha as toys. Remember this, this is important for later. And yet, they also vitally mark the transitionary period where mecha's massive dimorphism would explode, where through designers like Okawara, mecha as machines would be considered. And this is in part why I think it's so pivotal and so great a place to start. Okawara is an example of an artist who worked with the directors that would approach mecha seriously, and would work as basically the visual communicator for transferring that into a style. In a way, it almost seems by raw chance, and pure talent, that Okawara's designs would mark three of the most significant and influential family lineages in Mecha. We will go through each and really show how, while time has passed, their influence really lives on and has played a massive part in the story of Mecha right now to this very present day. Gundam. I mean, let's not avoid it really. This central visual pivot point of arguably one of the most influential and important science fiction series in Japan ever, the RX-78 Gundam, in its original transformation from the 70s toy to the white future samurai mecha warrior, was designed by Okawara. While obviously many later designers would put twists on this design, I think it really goes to show just how important and amazing this thing is. It feels like the earliest common ancestor, a kind of mecha homo erectus. Of course, in part, Gundam is iconic from its story and approach to mecha in general, but still, as great a story as it would be, it was the visualizations of the titular Gundam by Okawara's designs 
that would eventually contribute to a really iconic, universal understanding of what Gundam visually looked like. In retrospect, it took much of the 1970s field of mechanical design and really pared it down to this point of aesthetic simplicity. It's hard to imagine the landscape of Mecha without the extended family tree of white future samurai that would all inherently descend from this ancestral point. And the influence? I mean, even outside of Gundam, the Evangelion units were supposed to originally be white, but this was changed to purple and green and the other color schemes because white was so strongly associated with Gundam. I mean, holy crap, it was made in real life, in one-to-one. -one. And soon, for the 2020 Olympics, it will be made to move as well. It's kind of nuts. In addition, a satellite launched from the ISS has both the RX-78 and Sharzaku on it. So, it's also really just ironic considering, as Okawara explains from this one interview, what one of the big origins of the eventual final form of Gundam's design came from. This one is directly based around the astronauts' clothing. Since it was Mecha, it would be the focus of merchandising. I proposed this, literally taking the idea from the astronauts' clothing, and then made it into a Mecha. Beyond just the Gundam, Okawara's work would also define the Zaku, another seemingly timeless design that would continue on for now 40 years since its first visual appearance. In that same Forbes interview, he specifically mentions how, in terms of the Zeonic designs in the original Gundam, I got really involved in were the Zaku, Goof, and Dom. So these were the ones I worked hard on. However, the other designs towards the end of the series, then Tomino would send me rough ideas. All I did for that was then filter it through the character sheet. Originally, I had this idea of how Xeon and Federation forces would look like, but after Tomino started sending me rough ideas, then that all got a bit messed up. So I have to attribute the number and variety of mobile suits to Tomino. All I did was clean up those rough ideas to something that looked three-dimensional. And this, I think, is really fascinating, because as much as things have changed in Gundam, and I do one day want to make a video on that, it is amazing to think that they still somewhat hold true to what were these early ideas and designs proposed by Okawara and put forward. Things like the GM Federation and Gundam using visors and face masks and perhaps using white, whereas Xeon would use mono eyes, more curvy organic shapes, big flaring cuffs, bits of spikes, and so on. Both in terms of heroes and villains, Okawara's work on Gundam set a benchmark that while well iterated on has almost more or less held completely true across now nearly half a century of mechanical design. Dugram. The next lineage, I think, has one of the funniest transformational stories even on par with Gundam's longevity, that of Okawara's designs for Fang of the Sun Dalgrim. And this is mainly because it ended up massively shaping Western conventions of mechanical design to this very day. Dugram was more mature. Dugram was more intense. A guerrilla war, filled with political intrigue and for good reason a show I still count as a favorite in the genre of mecha, but it also visually wanted to go even further than Gundam. Whereas Gundam was a kind of lungfish transition from the styles of the 1970s, much of mecha would more or less linger around that level for its design and approach in the coming decades. With Dugram though, a new challenge existed for Okawara, to visually communicate an even more grounded, pragmatic approach to what mecha was as a vehicle, something used in combination with other war machines and even less important or special in comparison, especially next to something like the mobile suits of Gundam. As Okawara explains, normally a mecha's face is the most important thing, but Takara proposed to me quite a new idea, because they wanted to make a real battle mecha, so using a battle helicopter's cockpit as a head, so that's how Dugram came about. Within the team I was working within, there was a junior guy from my university, so we could mock up as soon as I did the design, and that allowed me to check how it looked in the real world very quickly. At the time, the director for the animation side was Hirosuke Takahashi and Takayuki Kanda. Kanda was extremely knowledgeable about armaments and weapons in general, so it was going to be full-on battle-type story. So the emphasis then becomes clear. In order to ground the machines, incorporate real-world mechanical language into their design. Mecha would not have faces, they would have glass cockpits, or the vision slits of tanks, and so on. They would have IR smoke launchers pulled from real vehicles like the ones on the Iron Foot, and the rocket pods of attack helicopters like those on the titular Dugram, and many others. Okawara would borrow and interweave the visual language and materiality of real-world fighting machines into Mecha, and this would have the effect of grounding these designs and making their impression one of staunch believability, because modern viewers would already mentally associate the image they were familiar with, of real-life fighting machines, with these designs. And so, all in all, it's a great job. But now I think it's time to talk about maybe the darker, or even more absurd aspect of mechanical design in relation to Dugram. It's time to talk about Battletech 
Harmony Gold, and The Unseen. Now wait, you might say, I thought this episode was about Kunio Akawara. Tell me what his favorite toothpaste brand is. And it is, and I have no idea. But it's also about mechanical designers. And so it's important to basically put in context how they exist within the fucking Shoggoths attached to other Shoggoths that is the entertainment industry. So Kunio Akawara was asked by Ryosuke Takahashi to design and draw a robot. He did. And he did a great job. And here's the thing, Okawara does not own his designs. Yeah, this might be shocking for some people, but the design belonged to Sunrise. The mechanical designer transferred its rights to the company. They, through Dugram, would use it to produce toys and so on. And long ago, before the internet, when the cultural gap across the oceans was something larger of a thing, in the 80s, a western board game company, FASA, probably made of people who perhaps watched Mecha and enjoyed it, wanted to make a game with Mecha as its focus. Now they needed designs, but what better than to buy the rights to use some of those designs they already love? Great, so they did that. Then the 80s shriveled up and died, and along the way, Battletech was made and it was a success. The game they made even sort of took Okawara's approach that Takahashi had wanted, the incorporation of real-world military vehicle language into its designs, and made their own. If you want proof, look no further than I totally don't have a B-29 Super Fortress cockpit for a face, Mad Cat as an example of such. While it's true, not every original Battletech design came from this place, many of the most iconic did, and are well known for doing so. But then, FASA made two big mistakes. One, they started to make a good amount of money, and two, they tried to sue Playmates, a toy company, see I told you it all comes back to the fucking toys, for making a toy like that, but they lost. Now forget Playmates, they don't matter. What matters is they were friends with the real villain of the story, Harmony Gold. To those that know, they are already angry with sweat at its very name. Harmony Gold sued FASA, the Battletech company. Oh, you say, okay, uh, Harmony Gold made the anime, and they own the rights, and they made Dugger- wait. No, they didn't. And that's right, Harmony Gold made nothing. What Harmony Gold made is a stinking turd of a show called Robotech, which is actually the Frankenstein monster of pieces of several other anime wrapped together and then sold to Western audiences. This is because at the time, there really wasn't a lot of focus for these individual anime companies to directly market themselves outside of their home territories. And here is an Argonbolt diamond promise. I will never like, nor will review, Robotech. If you like it, I understand you are probably an impressionable young nerd who grew up in an earlier period of anime and were vulnerable to the novelty of its elements and didn't have the easy access we do today. Uh, but it's still shit. And the original pieces of the things it was made from are better, and they're better when they're not called Robotech. Anyway, I know this is already a long tangent, but basically, Harmony Gold had bought the rights to some of those same things in anime form, and they still do to the unending pain of Macross fans. So Harmony Gold, a company which made nothing and basically just bought other people's intellectual property and made it into something worse, sued FASA, a company which had at least used others' intellectual property and sort of developed on it. And so, this is where it comes all around and our lovely little Dugram that Okawara drew could no longer be used within Battletech. And then it disappeared and was marked as unseen until a great while later, after many other lawsuits, Harmony Gold still exists, is still clinging to the Western Macross rights, somehow the Unseen did more or less sort of reappear. Hence how in 2020, you can play as a design that was once our Okawara Dugram, except now transformed and involved in a game that has nothing really to do with Dugram, and also it's no longer called Dugram. But in the largest form of irony, it did come from his works. And this is what I meant by Okawara's influence being so long, because he inadvertently helped contribute to a huge chunk of not just some of the most iconic Japanese series and their mechanical design, but also to some of the most iconic Western mecha design styles as well. They are both the accidental descendants of Okawara's mechanical design. And as he said, seeing my designs used elsewhere is exciting for me. My time was when my generation looked towards the designs done in the West, and then got inspired and made into their own projects. Now these things were made are inspiring people in places like Hollywood and elsewhere. And really, this is funny for two reasons. One, because Battletech and very much Mech Warrior ended up ditching Dugram's guerrilla warfare entirely, making Mecha more or less super duper powerful and special on a unique scale, and more or less massively superior to tanks and helicopters. Which, once again, there goes your real robot out the fucking window into the trash. But also it's funny because if you ever hear one of those guys, not just the guys who say, 
Oh, I prefer Mech Warrior mechs, but the ones who talk about how Gundam is lame and flashy, but their precious Mech Warrior or Battletech is so cool and realistic or grounded with their stompy robots, now you can laugh in their face! Because now you know that not only is it not really true, now you know the bigger context that in the end, both things basically come from the same place anyways. And also lol, Battletech realism is still a joke and is still a basically a romanticized version of war. But I digress. And so lastly, let's end on our plucky little fellow, Votoms. Votoms is similarly a pivotal design. With Votoms, Okawara channeled the feel and look of military jeeps, of small, practical vehicles. As Okawara explained, to explain a bit further, Takahashi was about five years older than me, and he was a kid during the Second World War. He remembered seeing the US Army jeeps around that time as he was growing up, and that whenever they drove around, they left a big oil slick everywhere making a really shiny oil pattern in the water patches all over the roads. So he was talking about these jeep-sized mecha as an idea. So once again, the creative director of Takahashi's vision was kind of directed into Okawara, who then channeled that into creating a machine that felt and moved like a light armored transport, a little jeep on legs. And ironically enough, once again, the trail of influence spiraled out. Votoms inspired Heavy Gear. Heavy Gear was a board game that later inspired many western sources. So once again, without Okawara and his designs, you don't get something like Titanfall. And also, once again, if you see anyone trying to flex about how real Titanfall is and how it's not those big stompy mech warrior mecha, you know what to do. Laugh in their face. Because now you know where it all comes from. And this is why I think Okawara was a good first choice. He serves not just as a foundational in one way, but across many massive lineages that all draw their roots back towards a single man drawing machines living in Inagi, Japan. And that fact, the way he influenced so much culture, is really fucking cool.